Today I'm going to talk about Chenango, which is a system that enables applications and data centers to achieve high CPU efficiency and low tail latency simultaneously. This is joint work with my colleagues at MIT, Josh, Jonathan, Adam, and Hari. There are two major trends in hardware that are impacting data centers today. The first is that networking hardware is getting faster. So if we look at how hardware has changed over the last 10 years, we can see that latencies have dropped by a factor of 20 and throughputs have increased by a factor of 100. And faster networking hardware is on its way. But unfortunately, today's operating systems are not optimized for such fast networking hardware, and they add significant overheads to network operations. This makes it difficult for applications to achieve the high network performance that the underlying network has to offer. As a result, people are increasingly turning to using kernel bypass network stacks in order to achieve high network performance. Traditionally, cores, as shown in blue here, would be shared by the application and the kernel. And in order to send or receive a packet, an application would make a system call. And then the kernel would interface with the networking hardware. With kernel bypass, applications circumvent the kernel. We dedicate some number of cores to running only this application, and each core busy spins, directly pulling the NIC hardware in order to send and receive packets. This enables much higher throughput and lower latency than the existing approaches, because applications avoid the overhead of traversing the, the kernel for all network operations. At the same time, another major trend is impacting data centers today, and this is the slowing of Moore's law. With the slowing of Moore's law, it becomes more and more difficult to increase the compute capabilities of an individual CPU. So to keep up with increasing demands for compute, we'll need more and more servers, which require more and more energy. To make matters worse, we're not fully utilizing our CPUs today. Across different data centers and clusters, we see utilization numbers ranging from 10 to 66%. So wouldn't it be great if instead of buying more servers, we could simply use our existing CPUs more efficiently instead? And when I say CPU efficiency, I mean the fraction of cycles that are spent performing useful work, as opposed to busy spinning or sitting idle. And because of the scale at which these applications operate, even small increases in CPU efficiency can save millions of dollars and terawatts of power. Unfortunately, achieving high CPU efficiency is challenging because of the variation we see in loads for data center applications. So for example, load can vary over daily cycles, as you see in this graph, but it can also vary over much shorter timescales. For example, we can see bursts of packet arrivals over a couple of microseconds, or bursts of threads that are spawned over similar timescales. What this means is that if you provision, that provisioning applications for peak load requires significantly more CPU resources than provisioning them for average load. So for example, if you were to run just one application on a server, even if it uses the whole server at peak load, it will waste a significant amount of CPU resources as load varies over time. As a result, data center operators have turned to multiplexing. There are two main classes of applications in data centers today. First, latency sensitive applications are typically user facing they have strict latency requirements, and load varies over time in, in response to user demand. Second, batch processing applications don't require low latency, and the goal with these applications is just to achieve as high throughput as possible. Data center operators today pack both types of applications on the same server, so that the batch processing applications can use the extra cycles as load varies for the latency sensitive applications. So for example, in the past, you might have run your latency sensitive applications, such as the memcached key value store, on one set of servers, and your batch processing applications, such as Hadoop, on another set of servers. But today, you would run each of these applications on all of your servers, and you might pack a whole bunch of other applications on there as well. And data centers are doing this in practice. For example, Bing does this on over 90,000 servers today. So how do existing systems perform in this sort of multiplexed environment? As an example, let's look at the performance that we can achieve with memcached, a popular key value store. In this experiment, we have a server that's running memcached. A client issues requests to memcached over the network. The server takes about one microsecond to construct a response and sends it back to the client. At the same time, we also run a batch processing application on the server, which uses any cycles not used by memcached. So what kind of performance would we hope to achieve? Let's suppose that the maximum memcached throughput that we can achieve on the server is about 6 million requests per second. What we'd hope is that the tail latency for memcached would remain low for different memcached loads up until we reach the peak throughput, at which point tail latency would increase dramatically. At the same time, for our batch processing application, we would expect to get no throughput at peak memcached load because all of our cycles are dedicated to the batch application. But we would hope that at lower loads, we're able to linearly trade throughput for memcached for throughput for the batch processing application. So this is the performance that we get if we run Linux. 
we can see that Linux achieves quite poor tail latency. If you were to run memcached alone on this machine without a batch processing application, Linux would achieve a tail latency of about 50 microseconds. So the presence of the, back, the batch processing application here has significantly degraded the tail latency to over 200 microseconds. And furthermore, Linux can't even sustain this tail latency for very high throughput. However, Linux is able to multiplex multiple applications, so it does achieve some throughput for the batch processing application. Instead, let's look at a kernel bypass stack. Zygos is a state-of-the-art kernel bypass networking stack. We can see here that it achieves much better performance for memcached. It maintains low tail latency for throughputs over 4 million requests per second. However, in order to achieve peak throughput for memcached, we have to dedicate it all of our cores. And this leaves no cores left for running the batch processing application, so we achieve no throughput. This means that at lower memcached loads, we're achieving very poor CPU efficiency. So what we can see from this experiment is that Linux achieves poor performance for the network, Zygos achieves poor performance for the CPU, and no existing approach is able to provide high network performance and high CPU efficiency simultaneously. So our goal in this talk is to reconcile this trade-off between CPU efficiency and network performance. And the way we hope to do this is by granting applications exclusive use of their cores and then reallocating cores across applications at microsecond granularity. Now you might wonder if microsecond granularity is really necessary. There are some existing systems that reallocate cores across applications every 50 to 100 milliseconds. So would one of these approaches be sufficient? The answer is unfortunately no. Intuitively, if your tasks take only a few microseconds to complete, bursts occur over microsecond timescales, and you can only reallocate cores every 50 to 100 milliseconds, you will have to provision your application with extra cores in order to maintain low tail latency. So with coarser granularities of core reallocations, you must sacrifice either CPU efficiency or tail latency. So what's difficult about reallocating cores quickly? You might think that you could just take an existing system that reallocates cores at millisecond granularity and tune it to reallocate cores at microsecond granularity. But unfortunately, this won't work because there are two challenges that existing systems have failed to address. The first is, at any given time, how many cores does an application need? So some existing approaches have used application level metrics, such as latency or throughput. But these provide feedback only every 100 microseconds or so, which is far too slow for our purposes. In addition, there are multiple sources of load to consider. You can have packets arrive over the network, or applications can spawn threads. And both of these can impact how many cores an application needs. The second main challenge is the overhead of reallocating a core. So some prior approaches take hundreds of microseconds to reallocate a core across applications because they reconfigure packet steering rules in hardware on each core reallocation. So overall, there's no existing system that addresses both of these challenges today. Shenango overcomes these two challenges with two main contributions. First, it introduces an efficient algorithm for determining when applications need more cores. And this, uh, this algorithm is based on the queuing delay of threads and of packets. This algorithm requires fine-grained high-frequency visibility into application thread and packet queues, which is not possible in existing systems today. Therefore, Shenango makes a second contribution, which is the IO kernel. The IO kernel is a single busy spinning core. It steers packets and software and allocates cores across applications. Because it steers packets and software, the IO kernel can reconfigure software packet queues very quickly when core allocations change. So the result is that core reallocations complete in about five microseconds. In addition, Shenango contributes an algorithm for deciding which cores to allocate to each application based on cache affinity. And it also contributes an approach to load balancing, which allows packet protocol handling to be load balanced across cores, in addition to application level work. This enables better performance for unbalanced workloads, such as those with few connections. In this talk, I'm going to focus on the first two contributions. Shenango's design consists of two main components. First, Shenango includes a runtime. Application logic runs in per application runtimes, one per application. Applications link with the runtime library, which provides useful programming abstractions such as threads, mutexes, condition variables, and blocking network sockets. At any given time, a runtime is granted a specific number of cores. Each core has its own local run queue, and application logic runs in lightweight user level threads, which are placed into these queues. Work is balanced across cores using work stealing. Next, the Shenango includes the IO kernel. The IO kernel is a single busy spinning core. It pulls NIC queues so that applications don't have to. It steers packets between hardware NIC queues and per core packet queues in the runtimes. 
In addition, it tracks which cores are idle and how many cores have been allocated to each application. And it orchestrates core reallocations by running the algorithm that determines how many cores each application needs. So how should the IO kernel decide how many cores to allocate to each application at any given time? There are two main ways that we add a core to an application. First, if a packet arrives for an application that currently doesn't have any cores allocated, we can immediately grant it a core. And this is only possible because the IO kernel is on the data path, so it has visibility into packet arrivals. The second way that we grant a core is that the IO kernel runs a periodic algorithm to determine if any applications would benefit from more cores. If this is the case, it will grant the application an additional core. In either case, granting a core to an application may require preempting a core from another application. When applications have no work to occupy a core, they yield it voluntarily. So let's talk more about how this periodic algorithm works. To help us understand how many cores an application needs, we introduce an idea that we call compute congestion. And this term is inspired by the notion of congestion in networking. We say that an application suffers from compute congestion if granting it an additional core would allow it to complete its work more quickly. So for example, suppose we have an application that currently has been allocated two cores, and it has two threads, one that's running on each core. It's not currently congested. However, if it were to spawn another thread, it would now be suffering from compute congestion because we could handle this thread on a third core in parallel. Our goal with Shenango is to grant each application as few cores as possible while avoiding compute congestion. This ensures that we can maintain low tail latency while freeing up underused cores for use by other applications, thereby increasing CPU efficiency. So how can we determine when compute congestion is occurring? Note that we must do this efficiently. We cannot afford to spend tens of microseconds determining if an application is congested. For this, we introduce the congestion detection algorithm. This algorithm considers two indications of congestion, the queuing delay of threads and the queuing delay of packets. The way it works is that it runs every five microseconds. And every time it runs, it checks each of the run queues within an application and each of the incoming packet queues. And it checks to see if there are any packets or threads that have remained queued since the last time we ran the algorithm five microseconds ago. If this is the case, it will grant that the IO kernel will grant that application another core. And it turns out that we can perform this check quite efficiently if we implement each of these, each of these queues as a ring buffer. So let's look at an example. Suppose this is one of the, the incoming packet queues for this application. The head pointer indicates where the IO kernel will end queue more packets, and the tail pointer indicates where the runtime will process packets from. So suppose that the ring buffer looks like this one time we run the algorithm. Over the next five microseconds, some more packets may arrive, and the runtime may process some packets. So the next time we run the algorithm, the head and tail pointers have moved. And we can see here that there are two packets that have remained queued since the last time we ran the algorithm. So the application is, in fact, congested. But we can actually determine this really efficiently by observing that the head pointer from the previous iteration is greater than the tail pointer from the current iteration. In contrast, if the runtime had processed an additional two packets so that the head and tail pointers were now equal, we would see that the application was not suffering from compute congestion. And runtimes can expose these head and tail pointers to the IO kernel in a single cache line of shared memory per core. This means that checking for compute congestion can be done quite efficiently and without synchronization costs. The two key features of this algorithm are that it considers both thread and packet queues as sources of congestion, and that its mechanisms are efficient enough to run every few microseconds. No existing system includes either of these properties, and these are what make this algorithm effective. We have implemented Shenango. It uses DPDK for low latency access to NIC queues. Our runtime includes implementations of UDP and TCP, and bindings for C++ and Rust. In total, our system is about 13,000 lines of code. Our evaluation focuses on three main questions. First, how, how well does Shenango reconcile the trade-off between CPU efficiency and network performance for different applications and workloads? Next, how well does Shenango respond to sudden bursts in load? And finally, how does Shenango's individual mechanisms contribute to its overall performance? I will focus on the first two here. For our experiments, we have one server and six clients, and all of our machines use 10 gigabit per second NICs. Clients run our own open loop load generator, which is built on top of Shenango. Requests follow Poisson arrivals and use TCP. We evaluate four systems. First, we evaluate Linux, which balances tasks across cores every four milliseconds. Next, we evaluate Zygos, a state-of-the-art kernel bypass network stack, 
which does not provide any mechanisms for reallocating cores across applications. Third, we evaluate Arachne, a state-of-the-art user-level threading system, which reallocates cores across applications every 50 milliseconds. And finally, we evaluate Shenango, our system, which integrates with a kernel bypass network stack and reallocates cores across applications every five microseconds. So let's revisit the Memcached experiment that we looked at earlier in this talk. To refresh your memory, we have a client that's issuing Memcached requests to a server, and the server is also running a batch processing application. We saw that Linux achieved very poor performance for Memcached, but some throughput for the batch processing application, while Zygos achieved good performance for Memcached, but no throughput for the batch processing application. If we add Arachne to this graph, we can see that it achieves much better tail latency than Linux, and it sustains this latency for throughputs of up to a million requests per second for Memcached. At the same time, for the batch processing application, Arachne does achieve some throughput because it's able to reallocate cores across applications. Now let's look at Shenango. For Memcached, Shenango is able to maintain low tail latency, similar to that of Zygos, and it sustains this for throughputs of over 5 million requests per second. At the same time, when Memcached throughput is lower, Shenango is able to trade throughput for Memcached for throughput for the batch processing application. So what we can see here is that Shenango is able to achieve the latency profile of a state-of-the-art kernel bypass network stack while fully utilizing the CPU for useful work, thereby achieving high CPU efficiency. And there are three interesting things to notice about these graphs. First, if we compare the tail latency achieved by Shenango and Zygos to those of Linux and Arachne, we can see the benefits of using kernel bypass networking. And it's only possible for Shenango to use kernel bypass networking while also reallocating cores across applications because of the presence of the IO kernel, which is able to quickly reconfigure packet steering rules in software whenever core, reallocations, core allocations change. At the same time, having a single core that forwards all packets in the system can eventually become a bottleneck. So in this experiment, the IO kernel becomes saturated at around 5.5 million requests per second for Memcached. And this prevents Shenango from achieving higher Memcached it throughputs here. This is because of the short one microsecond service times of Memcached. With longer service times, the IO kernel does not limit throughput. And finally, if we look at the throughput achieved by the batch processing application, we can see that Shenango achieves much higher throughput than any of the other systems we evaluated. The reason for this is that Shenango reallocates cores across applications so quickly that it doesn't need to over-provision cores for Memcached in order to maintain low tail latency. And this frees up more cores for running the batch processing application. So in the previous experiment, each data point represented a constant load. But what happens if we change the load suddenly? In this experiment, a client sends TCP requests to a server. The server performs one microsecond of synthetic work and then sends a response back to the client. And we also run a batch processing application on the server. In this experiment, we change the load every second. So this graph shows the load offered over the course of the experiment. We begin by offering a baseline rate of 100,000 requests per second. And after a second, we increase the load instantaneously to an elevated rate. We sustain this elevated rate for a second and then decrease the load back to the previous baseline rate. And we repeat this several times for different elevated rates. This graph shows the tail latency achieved by Arachne. You can see that every time we increase the load, its tail latency spikes to over a millisecond. And it takes it hundreds of milliseconds in order for it to recover. Arachne is also not able to sustain throughputs higher than a million requests per second in this experiment. In contrast, Shenango maintains low tail latency across each of these changes in load. In particular, it maintains low tail latency even when we drastically change the load from 100,000 requests per second for 5 million requests, to 5 million requests per second instantaneously. And the reason for this is that Shenango reallocates cores across applications 10,000 times as often as Arachne, allowing it to quickly respond to changes in load before any queuing builds up in the system. So in conclusion, Shenango is able to reconcile the trade-off between low tail latency and high CPU efficiency. And the way that it does this is by reallocating cores across applications at microsecond granularity. This is possible because of two main contributions. First, an efficient congestion detection algorithm, and the IO kernel, a single busy spinning core which allocates cores and steers packets in software. The code for our system and for reproducing all of our experiments is on GitHub. Thank you, and I'm happy to take questions. Hi, Chris Kuzirak is Google and Stanford. This is great work, congrats. Um, one quick observation and question. The observation is that you may want to try Linux with a different policy like uh, board virtual time 
and it will do somewhat better. Not as good as your system, but, but it will look a little Sorry, bit better. Sorry, could you just repeat that? Uh, use Linux with a different scheduling policy, like borrowed virtual time, mm -hmm. as opposed to uh, PS. And, and it will do a little bit better, not much better, but it will do better. Uh, so the question that I have is about uh, cache inertia. So as you switch back and forth uh, a course between any kind of workloads, uh, one issue is that they have set in the cache. And you should do affinity optimization as you do in the paper, but you may also want to do things like uh, first use cache partitioning to control inertia, mm -hmm. and second, actually use inertia as a policy you know, metric that you take into account, like severe congestion, uh, so that you decide that it's not actually worth it touching that core. Let's just leave it like this. Can you comment about that? Like, have you seen issues with uh, uh, cache state you know, causing inertia? and? what you may be able to do about this? Yeah, so so we haven't studied cache inertia extremely thoroughly in this, but we do have a mechanism where we try and reallocate cores that the application has used recently. Um, so we do a couple of things here, like uh, we try and allocate a core that is a hyper-thread pair of an, a core already running for an application, um, and if that's not possible, we try and run or grant it a core that, um, that it has run on recently. But we don't have any mechanisms to say right now, for example, like there are no cores available that have good cache affinity, so we'll just hold off on granting a core. Um, that's something we haven't done, but it would be interesting to look at. Yeah, it'd be cool to do that. Yeah. Um, Ramlai Joss from Rice University. I just wanted to know, how much improvement do you think you could get if you used um, something like Intel Flow, uh, Flow Director to steer packets rather than having every packet go through the I.O. kernel and being forwarded? Yeah, so I think, um, yeah, clearly the I.O. kernel does become a bottleneck when you have really low packet rates. So we've been considering ways of trying to move the I.O. kernel off of the data path um, so that you can scale up to higher throughput. So I think the, the biggest change would be you would be able to achieve higher throughputs um, if you were able to have the I.O. kernel not actually involved in processing every packet. All right, thank you. Brent Stevens, uh, University of Illinois at Chicago. Uh, I thank you for the talk. I was trying to marry here the Shinjuku and Shinango in my mind, and I'm sort of thinking that they seem entirely complementary. Am I missing anything? Are there points where these won't be compatible? I think that's a really reasonable way of thinking about it. Um, so Shinjuku, Shinjuku focuses on achieving fast preemption for these workloads with high dispersion, um, and Shinango reallocates cores across applications. So you could imagine taking some of the fast preemption of Shinjuku and implementing that in the runtime and getting um, the benefits of both systems together. Thank you. We have one last question. So you mentioned it takes uh, 13,000 lines of code to build this. Um, can you tell us like which part is the most, where the com complexity lies? I mean, honestly, I think a lot of the complexity would be in like context switching between threads. Um, that ends up being hard. I think also in um, like the communication between the IO kernel and the runtime, trying to get um, get them to communicate properly and avoid race conditions when you have cores that are yielding back to the IO kernel or you're waking cores at the same time. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. Uh, oh, one more. Okay. Hi, Aditya Akela from uh, University of Wisconsin. I really enjoyed your talk, especially the creative use of the term congestion. Um, I was actually, I had a question about uh, the congestion aspect. So you, you seem to have a local way of reacting to congestion where you look at each ring buffer and if you observe said congestion, you, you allocate more cores. But wouldn't it make more sense to look across co uh, applications and see which one needs the most and allocate cores in an uneven manner? across applications, and I'm, I'm assuming your mechanism doesn't allow for that as yet. Yeah, so right now the way, um, like you can imagine a scenario where multiple applications both want more cores, mm -hmm. um, so you have to decide like who gets the additional right. cores. Um, right now the way we've set up our system is that each application has a guaranteed number of cores that it's always allowed to use if it wants them, and then there's some number of additional cores that may not be guaranteed to any application, and those are just sort of taken on a, a first come, first serve basis. But you could imagine like, implementing smarter policies that say, like, if this application wants it, it can have higher priority than this other application. Um, we just haven't implemented But you that. can't do that at runtime. Just by uh, examining the unevenness in how much each application is backlogged, you can't, at runtime, decide, at this time, I, I need to give more cores to this application because it's building up bigger queues. Because that would need, need you to compare across different ring buffers. Which oh, so the IO kernel is the one that's making these observations and making these decisions. So the IO kernel has visibility nice. into all the applications. So it could it can implement whatever policy you want to mediate between different applications. OK, all right, thank you. All right, let's thank the speaker one more time.